Welcome to the FCS, a part of FCS Fans Nation, where we go down all the jackrabbit holes, are loaded with hotter takes in the inferno, and have a bigger crown than Duke Dog himself. The show you didn't want, you definitely didn't need, but here you are. Let's get into this. Welcome back, FCS fans and nation, to another episode of the FCS, a.k.a. the Football Chris Show, because my name fits conveniently into the acronym, damn it. Uh, And joining (laughs) me today is one of the biggest brains in the FCS, a man that most of you are probably aware of, but haven't heard from in a while, so I had to go shake off some rust, find him, and I got him here on the show with you guys today, joining me via the interwebs, Brian McLaughlin. How the heck are you today? I'm good, Chris. I appreciate you asking an old rust bucket like myself to talk about this stuff. I I love it. I know you love it and all the guys uh, with FCS Fans Nation, the awesome, you know, setup you guys have. Uh, you built something special, and it's uh, it, it was fun to see you guys in Frisco after the 2019 season. Uh, the only part that wasn't fun, if I think you'll agree with me, was freezing our rear ends off uh there the morning of the game when we're yeah <laughs> it was so bad we ended up gonna, in our cars yeah. yeah you don't end up for in, in texas for the snow right no like, and then this this year it rained we were like oh it's in may this time like at yeah. least we'll get good weather nope rain 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 lightning oh. delay just like Man, maybe all these people are right. Maybe we do need to move it from Frisco. Where's yeah. where's this weather? I'm just kidding. Frisco's perfect, but yeah, no, uh, it, it it is. It, well, the town is perfect for it. I mean, yep, and they embrace they, it. They and- love that game, and you know, I think you and I and Matt and all the guys, you know, I, I think uh, we we had probably talked about it over cold ale uh, <laughs> one of those years or one of those nights about. You know, should we do it in Orlando? And and granted, uh, you know, Orlando in January is gorgeous. I mean, it. Yeah. it, it you don't want to be there right now in yeah. in August, but no. uh, it would be guaranteed nice weather in Orlando. The only problem is uh, an event like that at a time of the year like that when everybody in the world wants to be in Orlando would get swallowed up. Now yeah. they've got two great stadiums for it, but. The you know so they've got the obviously the hotel space to yeah. host it. They've got the things to do other than uh, you know just going to the game. You could go to Disney. There's all kinds of fun stuff about it. But Orlando would I'm sure embrace it because they're a tourism economy. But they never would embrace it like Frisco. And and I always thought it was cool when we would go to the awards ceremony on Friday night, the day before the game. Mm-hmm. You know, they're giving out the Walter Payton, Jerry Rice, Buff Buchanan. And the mayor of Frisco is there every year and yeah. uh, gets up and speaks to the crowd. And, you know, you got all these All-Americans there and Jerry Rice and everything and the and the mayor of Frisco. That's how much Frisco cares about that game. So, but it does seem, it's crazy, man. The first time in my life I ever went to Dallas was uh, in college and it was in the summer. And I swear it was hotter than Florida. It yeah. was so hot. And uh, and to go there in January, and it seems like every year we get at least snow flurries at some point. But that's that's Texas for you. So, yeah. So, you got to keep it in Frisco. Yeah. yeah. I mean, right? And that game is so crazy. Like, I was, the first time I went was 2018, the Eastern Washington North right. Coast State game. Right. Got, right. A sun, got a sunburn. <laughs> then I go the next year. Don't bring any winter clothes because I'm like, last year I got a sunburn. Yeah. Then I get frozen out, and all I have is a hoodie because that was the only warm clothes I brought. Yeah. And then last year I brought like a coat, thinking like, oh, you know, just in case, like a windbreaker. Yeah. Dumps rain, soaked. Yeah. All of my clothes. I forgot. I did a cardinal mistake. Forgot to unpack right when I got home. Left my backpack full of clothes for a week or two uh, in the little laundry room area in my house. Uh-huh. Ooh, that's a quick way to get a moldy backpack. Little gamey. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah. Uh, yep. uh, anyways, Brian. So before we uh, we're talking end of the year, man. We're we're skipping some stuff. So it's week zero this week, um, right. and we're gonna, we're going to talk that. But before like. Uh, I've noticed anyone that follows you on Twitter has noticed you have, you have dabbled your toes back into the FCS waters a bit here. Yes. So what have you been up to? And, uh, you know, are, are people going to start hearing from from BMAC more? Yes. Yeah. Um, so this is what happened, folks, because um, I, I never wanted to leave doing FCS. It was, um, it was really the most satisfying thing in my career. I mean, it was. Uh, and I've had some fun stops, you know, at the Sporting News and doing the Parade All-American teams. And um, those were all big things I grew up with. So I was honored to get to work at those places. So and I love the people I worked with. Those were really cool. But, you know, the FCS, we you guys know this story, but we um, I, I, I hooked up with Hero back in 15. And uh, it, at the time it was known as Bennett Rank. And uh, I was one of their first hires. And when I started doing stuff with them, they said, uh, what do you want to do this fall? You know, we're really going to have a major push this fall. Do you want to be our main FBS point guy, you know, point man? And I was like, man, I did FBS recruiting and I pinch hit, you know, with bowl games and helping mm -hmm. out with uh, coverage. You know, we went to games at Sporting News. I was like, it's a saturated thing, man. We are not going to make a mark covering Alabama. But I was like, this FCS thing is so just ripe, you know, for having access. I was like, I think we could build this and see what happens. Well, it worked, man. And it really took off. And it was so fun because the schools cooperated. You know, um, you you could get uh, an NFL potential draft pick on the phone in less than three hours and that makes for some great stories and uh and great contacts and in uh, relationships and the whole bit so it was so fun and so, and mm -hmm. then we we weren't financially viable like we wanted to be and they sold us during covid um you know there wasn't a whole lot of football going on you know and uh, they had actually, now that it, we're past it, um, they had actually had to cut our contracts in half. We were lucky we even had contracts. There were a lot of people let go in a million different industries. Mm -hmm. And sports media with no sports going on, you would think that that, well, how we even got, you know, half our contract was beyond me. That's just how nice Hero was. They were waiting it out. Well, bet MGM, you know, betting has cranked up since the con Congress, uh, you know, said, hey, states yep. can make their own decision. And gee, does states are going to allow gambling. It's a, it's a huge revenue generator mm -hmm. now that it's no longer a, a federal crime. And they bought Hero. And the biggest thing working at Hero was FCS. I never understood that move with Bet MGM because I, we're not, I mean, I, people bet on FCS, but it's not a huge revenue stream and when we came on board they basically said we don't really have room for two guys to be doing fcs and that's you know sam ended up taking that on and you know you know from hanging out with us sam and i are good friends mm -hmm. <clears throat> and i was happy for him because with him having attended ndsu and and he loves the fcs just as much as i do you know it was great for him but i was taken off of it and uh now it didn't I don't need to get into the details, but that stay did not work for me. And I resigned this week. And that's the first I've said anything about that. Um, uh, you know, if if I don't really want to get into the details, you can use, use your imagination about what was going on. So, um, so I'm going to try to be a, a, a little bit in the mix with conversation uh, on Twitter. I don't want to lose uh the following you know people have been so great to follow our our accounts and um interact with us and give us a hard time like you and i were talking about before uh but giving us a hard time heaping praise on i don't care i love i love talking to people and mm -hmm. i love talking period as you can probably tell so uh yes as of monday 
uh what, what was that uh the thir- 23rd yep the monday august 23rd yeah i'm uh gonna be involved and i'm still trying to find out about exactly how and i'm i'm going to have some announcements down the line about some ideas i have and we'll we'll take it from there so that's that's it that's the long version of what's yeah. going on and uh yeah i i can't wait to see what happens this weekend even with these games there there are some it it is interesting i mean week zero is kind of interesting and i know we're going to touch on that but uh mm-hmm. it's, it's fun to know that uh you know i've got the freedom to jump into this because i i do have some contracts already and uh but i'm gonna i'm gonna make this a part of what i do so yeah there you, there you go chris we're we're just happy to have you back on on the beat in the fcs street right like, yeah yeah uh, it, it's a it's a shot. I mean, I don't want to speak for every fan, but I think I can speak for a good, healthy chunk of them. You know, when we had you and Sam and Craig, it's kind of like the three overarching heads of FCS as a whole, right? And then right. you have the great regional guys, like uh, all the dudes that uh, do the stuff for NDSU, the Coulter Nuanas, et cetera. Like oh, yeah, have, yeah. You have yeah. the really good regional, um, really good beat riders. And then you kind of have, you know, our group of like, you know, more of the fun fan based little less structured stuff and we had this great community but you know it's all kind of over arching from like you know the stalwarts as it were of like you craig and sam so uh losing one of them we still had sam and craig and that's good um but having another big voice someone that you know been around has talked to coaches i mean me being a recruiting guy it was mm-hmm. uh it was yeah. really off this year not having b max recruiting rankings going on yeah um <laughs> so it's it's, I think I can speak for most people and say, well, welcome back to the FCS. Um, we're happy Thank to have you. you. Thanks, but, man. Uh, it's great to great to talk to you again. And I still have your uh, Idaho hat, man. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why wouldn't you? It's a beautiful, beautiful it, it, hat. It's, it's such a beautiful hat, no doubt. Yeah. I, I wish I had more from other schools. I may, uh, I may start to collect those again. Yeah, yeah. That's, I, that's for anyone that wants to give me FCS swag, I – I am an equal opportunity FCS wearer. So yeah, hell yeah, <laughs> man, hell yeah. Um, but yeah, so talking about things that have kind of left the FCS, um, week zero. Let's talk about it as a oh, before we go into the individual games. Yeah, uh, kind of talk about week zero as a as an overarching concept, right? Because like, <laughs> um, it used to be an FCS thing. Uh, and now you look at it and it's, it's trickled away from that. It really kind of always started, not always, but you had that Montgomery kickoff uh, where, you know, you had Jacksonville state playing it for a while or whatever, and they still sure. are, sure. but it was yep. week zero and it used right. to be only FCS teams. Now it's not even week zero, it's week one. Yeah. And they're playing an FBS team. And you look like, I remember watching like Cal play Hawaii in Australia one year. So you had like one offs like that, where it's really weird. Like a team might be playing, like a Pac-12 team usually playing abroad or over in the Pacific. Yeah, kind of like playing Tokyo help, or yeah, yeah, yeah. To yeah. Kind of help spread the game. Um, but like I remember, I was at BS at the time, uh, being a Vandal fan. But I remember tuning in and watching the Montana Grizzlies and North Dakota State, which is our background on the show today. <laughs> oh yeah, 2015-16, oh, yeah. whatever that was. There, uh, the Smoke of Missoula. They had, oh, yeah. um, oh god, can't think of his name, but the like just amazing announcer who's from Montana, who's just been a part of so many Rose Bowls and everything like that. Um, Musburger. You are looking live at Washington Grizzly Stadium in Missoula, Montana. The 2015 college football season on ESPN. Yeah. Uh, yep. You know, and it was, it was this event. And I remember having friends with me that, that weren't big FCS guys, not even big college football people. Right. And like, I was like, hey, you got to watch this. Like, I remember... In college, I still kept up with the FCS. Obviously, football, Chris show. I love all things football, but I remember like rooting for NDSU in the early years because I was like, "Oh, it's so cool to see a three P. Oh, this school was just D two not that long ago. It's so cool to see them running like you know show." Fast forward, you know, eight, nine, ten, eleven years now, little less cool to see them dominating. But at the time, like I remember being so hyped on that and growing up in the Northwest, knowing about Montana and you know former Big Sky opponent of Idaho, like. I remember watching that game and like getting people like, no, I don't think you realize you're going to watch some really good football here. Carson yep. Wentz was in that game. Yep. Um, 
I mean, Brady, like great Brady uh, Gustafson, Gustafson was the yeah. quarterback, and he looked like a pro prospect that day. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. for Montana, Bob Stitt's first game, and everybody's going, "Holy smokes!" Like, right, you know, right. they hadn't had any success with Flugrad after uh, Bob, uh, Hauk left the first time. Right, like, okay, we're we're back. Like this Bob Stitt guy is going to be the man. Obviously, things change. That's college football. Um, but man, like I remember watching that, and then watching all these games throughout the years too that happened on Week Zero. It's, I don't know. For me, it's kind of sad to see. And I want to, we'll get into the predictions and the matchups here a little bit later, but it just kind of is sad because it used to feel like week zero was a standalone thing for the FCS. And yeah. they originally did such a good job of putting their best foot forward and finding their <coughs> best week one or week two game and moving it to that week zero mark where you had Montana and North Dakota state in a packed stadium in a beautiful environment. And were able to get world-class announcers to call it on ABC or ESPN, whatever it was on. Uh, and people around the country that aren't even football people can watch that and go, this is, this looks like football, you know, sounds like football feels like football. Holy crap. Yeah. This FCS thing is football. And it, it's, it's changed a bit. So, I mean, I kind of want filibustered a bit there, but, you know, we're trying to whip through five, six, seven years of week zero and, you know, yeah. 30, 40 minute podcast with other stuff we got to cover. But um, your what are your week zero thoughts, rem- you know, memories and where you think it's going and maybe what we can do to fix this? Yeah, no, I, I feel you, man. Uh, you know, I the, the, that 2015 game was the first uh, game that I uh, was writing about doing this FCS stuff. And I... <laughs> They wanted me to stir the pot, and honestly, I thought pretty highly of Montana that year after doing a lot of research. Um, obviously, NDSU spoke for itself, but Montana looked pretty good on paper, and with it being at you know up in Missoula, I'm like, I don't know, man. I think this, and you know, regardless of Carson Wentz, and, and I, I thought, man, this looks like a a recipe for an upset and i was like and if it you know if it looks like there's even a chance of that um i'm gonna write that there's gonna be an upset this weekend and i think um and i but you know at that time nobody knew who the hell we were and i'd never covered fcs so i didn't have a following at all i don't think anybody read it i I don't think <clears throat> but I did nail it. <laughs> and uh, by the end of the year, people were reading it and uh, reading what we were doing. And um, and I made another prediction that NDSU would not win the title. And I would look by then I had people reading my stuff and they said, ah, you're stupid. You know, look at you. You, you Come on. Don't doubt Even know history. this machine. <laughs> yeah. And I was basing that on uh, Jacksonville State giving Auburn fits that year. And you remember they took them to overtime mm-hmm. and I I'm like. You know, I'm I'm from SEC country. I went to an SEC school. I'm sitting there going, when, the one double A coming to the SEC. I mean, going to Vanderbilt and giving them hell is one thing. Coming, you know, yeah. coming into the swamp and giving a school like a Florida or an Auburn or an Alabama fits. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, man, that Jacksonville State team must be pretty darn good. I think maybe they could knock off NDSU. And of course, Carson Wentz was injured at the time. So I thought, ah, you know, I don't know, man. NDSU got beat by Montana. Then they got beat by South Dakota. I don't think they're going to win it all this year. And I was very brazen in that pick, and I got that wrong, man. Um, but it was all fun. And mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, anyways, uh, you okay, so you asked about week zero, um, and I meandered there a bit. It was fun, and – I remember that that game real well because my brother, who's a big Gator fan, um, didn't know anything about these schools. And, you know, we were football starved and they're banking on that. That's why they put it there, you know. And I think that's why Austin P and um, who do we have last year? Austin P and Central Arkansas. Central Arkansas, yeah. Had, had that, you know, last year. Um, you know, we had not even had a whole lot of sports uh, since COVID cranked. Nope. And there was a lot of interest in that game, especially with gamblers, by the way, if you remember that. And uh, yeah. <coughs> my brother and I watched the whole NDSU Montana game over at his house that night. And he's like, man, this is pretty good football. And you're right. It's it's a hell of a stage for our level. You're going to bring in fans that, boy, once P5 football cranks, 
they're not going to watch FCS games. No. But the curiosity about NDSU is it was huge because they had been on ESPN game day two straight years leading in. They'd won national titles. Carson Wentz was being talked about as a potential, you know, top 10 draft pick, which he ended up being. It, there was all kinds of curiosity about that, not to mention Montana's backdrop, dude. Can you imagine? The, yeah. The, what a scenic backdrop, and their fans are awesome, and it just – everything about that game was perfect to stand alone. And mm-hmm. you're right, now they're, now it's kind of swallowed up. I mean, <clears throat> I do think that the Jacksonville State-UAB game betting, man. is, um, you know, the uh, – uh, those are two old rivals. And, uh, yeah. you know, that that game might end up being a good game between two good teams. Uh, but, uh, you know, th- that that's a good matchup for the FCS kickoff. But you're right. Things have just been di- different. And uh, and, it, and it's got, kind of gotten obscured. So uh, that's kind of what's happened since 15, to, in my opinion. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, it's like they came up with this brilliant idea. And obviously the FBS saw it, right? But I mean, and that's why we're where we are, where we are, where what we've got Illinois versus Wisconsin this weekend. I think a couple other FBS games as well. Um, but obviously, I'm focused on the FCS side of it. But yeah, and yeah, it's we talked about sports betting. It's like the only week that usually your the FCS spreads um, are coming out. Yeah. You know, beforehand. I mean, I don't use. I I could apologize. Bet MGM does or whatever, but uh, uh, I, they're not who I use, unfortunately, for <laughs> the state I live in. So uh, <coughs> people that I yep. use don't put spreads out till Friday. Yeah, so you only right. have one day to like really take analysis and research the matchups you think are going to be good, and there's still money to be won. But week zero is like. The, the spreads out three weeks in advance and you have time to do it. And even this year, they're not doing it uh, with just the fact that the Illinois uh, and Wisconsin game or whoever the heck it is, it's just, it's driving the attention. And yeah, um, and like even the San Jose state Southern Utah game, I don't think has a spread out and that's an FBS FCS overlap. So right. um, that's right. sad. And I, I think it was so great. And I think part of the issue was they did such a good, like we touched on, such a good job putting best foot forward. And then they kind of slowly moved away from that. But then they kind of created that Montgomery kickoff classic where it's like, yeah. okay, at least they're making it like an actual thing. Like people can always call it like the Montgomery classic or kickoff classic or week zero, but it was, it's going to be there. It's going to be two teams probably out of the Southern footprint, but at least we know what it is. And while like we talked about it, that still exists, it just moved to week one and against UAB who yes, yeah, is a traditional rival of Jacksonville state, but it's like, now you're also promoting the FBS level and yeah, um, and, and not that it needs any more promotion and kind of what you said, like maybe people don't watch past week zero of FCS until the playoffs when those games get back on ESPN and you're still in those, those, you know, bad boy mowers bowl games where hmm. some people might be looking for a little bit higher tier or competitiveness of football than whoever's playing in Nassau in the Bahamas, right? And right. you get a Montana versus a Weber <clears throat> State in the snow, and you're flipping through the channels. You go, hmm, that's interesting. Oh, that Montana team. I saw them the very first week of the season. Right. I'll watch this over Middle Tennessee versus Northern Illinois. Like, yeah. Um, so I, that's where I think it's lost. Uh, plugs another great video that we just did on this channel about should the college football have a commissioner? Is this something where if you had a commissioner, even if it's just an FCS level commissioner, like something where this could have stayed around, would that be something that would benefit the league as a whole? But uh, we don't. And it's kind of moved away. And it's sad for me. I hope maybe we can figure it out. I know my Idaho Vandals play Oregon in week zero in 2024. Mm -hmm. That's I'm happy we're on week zero. We're going to be probably on national TV. But like, that's not the game I want Idaho week zero. I want like Idaho versus you know, Missouri state, get the two Petrinos week zero, yeah. not Idaho, Oregon, like that get Bobby and Paul on the same screen that will sell tickets. But um, I don't know. I, I would love to see us revert back to that, find the best matchup week one or week two and move that into uh, like this year, 
NDSU versus NCA and T would be a fantastic week zero matchup. Um, yeah. Uh, you, you've got a couple matchups like that, that you're just like, man, this would be um, a fun match to watch. But uh, unfortunately those kinds of matchups are going to get lost in the shuffle. And it's kind of like when NDSU played SDSU and college game day was there. Mm-hmm. ESPN didn't even stick around because there's just FBS. There's too much money. You're always going to lose it. So it's nice to have those showcase games that weren't, I don't want to say embarrassing. Uh, that's not the right word. Uh, lackluster. They're not as sexy as appealing. Like it's going to be harder to grab your friends that don't care about FCS or don't care about football at all and have them sit down and enjoy a game. Like I had two friends with me for last year's game, Central Arkansas versus Austin P. And, you know, they lost interest about halftime. I mean, it's just a little that's COVID. There wasn't the atmosphere, right? But, yeah, you know, this is first football in a while. And you can't even get some people that care about football to watch it just because at the end of the day, it was just like, uh, you know, there's no atmosphere. Who are these teams? We're like, I feel like you get one of the name brands versus somebody. And Central Arkansas and Austin P are doing their job to get there. But they weren't there. And, um I don't know. We, we've rambled on about this, but that's kind of my thoughts. It's, it's sad to see it go, and I'd like to see us try to bring it back. Uh, and I don't know how you go about it because I'm not sure how the scheduling of Week Zero goes. Uh, obviously, not everybody can do it. So yeah. I'm assuming there's some NCAA <clears throat> oversight that is there. Um, but speaking of the NCAA, yeah, yeah, I mean, if you're trying to get back into FCS coverage, Brian, uh, maybe the NCAA can hire you to run NCAA underscore FCS. Yeah, the Twitter account. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I was uh, talking to uh, Mike Kern uh, up at the Missouri Valley today, and um, he brought that up that uh, the NCAA has just flat out told him that they're just not going to be able to man that account like they normally do. And, you know, when schools are so starved for a, just a national outside view of, you know, their program which is what we have always tried to be. Uh, but even the NCAA account, you know, being balanced with talking about a, a school, a program, um, that they, they've they lost a huge voice because yeah. the NCAA account just, you know, the NCAA account wasn't necessarily throwing out tons and tons of, of opinions, but they it were recognizing solid. a big game. You know, yeah. they were recognizing facts, you know. Oh, yeah, they – they just broke a record with 400 yards rushing by this guy. Yep. Um, and I don't know. Authority. Where, yeah. It's so easy. And I know they're saying we're, we're cutting back. Everybody's cutting back. There are, I could hand them a list. I made the joke on Twitter. Like I'll DM you have some resumes. Like I could hand you 25 people that would run that account for free. They might even pay you to run the account. Like, and, and, you know, you got to teach them the professionalism of between the lines this is an NCAA thing. You can't be super edgy, but like, I don't know. I, I just look at that and go like, if they can't even figure out how to run a Twitter handle for the end for the FCS level, like that's what makes me worried that like week zero is probably gone at the FCS level from what we've known it. Um, because I mean, as you experienced with hero, it's uh, sometimes a struggle to get the eyeballs on it. Um, but at the same time, once you get the eyeballs, you know, you've, you've got almost a cult following. <laughs> it's a diehard following, no doubt. Yep. I mean, I think, it may not be the biggest in the whole universe, but the people who are tuning in are extremely loyal. Um, Some of them in the sense that they hate your guts, but a lot of them, you know, like what you're doing. And, and um, you're right. I mean, it's a, it's a fiercely active fan base collectively and, and uh yeah it's happened into that it's big and yeah hopefully something will budge on that ncaa thing you're right yep and I, I steal this from another good fcs podcast uh believe in the fcs or whatever the believe network with uh joe de Leon and sean anderson they say right. like there's not a more passionate fan base in the entire or a group of fans in the entire um country and what they say is like, now nah, we're not talking about like, you know, like you said, you're from Florida. Yeah, it's not like Florida fans, right? Or Texas fans. But what they're saying is like, as a collective, like you see it right now at the Big 12, other than the SEC, there's not a lot of conference pride. There's not a lot of what the FCS doesn't just have team pride, doesn't just have conference pride. The Missouri Valley, CAA, you know, SOCON, Big Sky, they're all think their leagues are the best. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's also the 
pride of the whole league. Like though, you know, Sam hates it. The fear of the FCS hashtag. Uh, everybody pumps the FCS when there's an upset. When Utah state upsets Utah, yep. you know, nobody outside the state of Utah is pumping that. Right. Right. No, right. There's not like a group of five handle. That's like, yeah, group of five over power five, but the FCS <laughs> level, yeah, you could have, it doesn't matter if it's Duquesne and it doesn't matter if they beat, you know, UConn, who's a struggling FBS independent, or yeah. if they beat Penn state, Yep. People will be equally excited that Duquesne pulled off the upset. And it doesn't matter how big the stage, the lights, the brights, you know, if an FCS team wins, the entire FCS community loves it. And that's they like, it it's hard to find. Like it's a unified voice. And some people have found out the hard way when they try to cross us like uh club trillionaire, I forget his name. And mm -hmm. some guy for cumulus down in Dallas, Texas said it was deep considers the FCS. He had interviewed, I don't know if you saw this, he interviewed uh, Danucci for the Cowboys. Uh -huh. And somebody made some comment about how, you know, you shouldn't refer to it as D2, FCS is D1. And then he made some comment back about like how uh, I consider the FCS D2 in football, just like they are in all their other sports. Um, <coughs> and then a lot of people were quick to get on him and remind him that, you know, well, Villanova's just won two, I like apparently division two basketball championships and you know, uh, yeah. they're D they're D one in all their sports. And, uh, there is a, a herd of people that were willing to uh, stand up for the FCS from all across the nation, from, you know, some of the more in, you know, insufferable fan bases, like, uh, yeah. you know, your bison in Montana, that usually get on people's nerves fighting alongside, uh, you know, your, Sam Houston state and your Cal Poly fans that were, yeah. you know, getting on this guy. So yeah, it's a, it's a very passionate fan base. Well, it's and, funny, it, you know, it's funny. You bring up Ben Danucci, great example. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, Ben, <clears throat> cause I asked him about this stuff uh, when he was looking like a draft pick, but also during his national championship game run that year that uh, we hung out with you guys at Frisco and Ben, uh, you know, had started his career at Pitt and he had started several games for Pitt at Heinz Field in front of, you know, great audiences. He played against Penn State. Mm -hmm. You know, he played in big time games in front of a lot of people. And I asked him because, you know, JMU is a very strong FCS program. <clears throat> and I asked him, I was like, OK, don't blow smoke because you happen to be in the FCS now. You know, you don't, don't, please don't be politically correct. How does it match up? And he was like, man, Brian, it's not that different. It's really not that different. It, he's like, you know, we've played a couple games in the CAA in my two years. He goes that, uh, he goes, it, he said the same thing that we always hear from coaching staffs and top players, you know, guys going in the NFL who have a chip on their shoulder, the difference between the strong FCS programs and maybe a middle of the pack P5, obviously we're not talking about Alabama here, but mm -hmm. you know, middle of the pack P5. Yeah. The biggest difference is depth, not talent. Like Ben said that he goes, when we line up against the Villanova Villanova has guys that could easily play up at one of the Northeast FBS schools. He goes Rutgers, UConn, Pitt, you know, uh, Syracuse, Boston College. You, you're telling me Villanova's top players couldn't play at places like that? Yeah, they could. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, they could. It is, and and then he he said he picked up on that same thing you were talking about, Chris. You know, and that's something I always love to ask the NFL draft pick potential guys was, hey, when you I'm just curious, you know, you're, you're a big superstar. You know, you, you got a big name. You've been mentioned as an NFL guy. How much did you pay attention to what was going on around the, the nation at the level you're at? And how much do you pay attention to the other guys from the FCS who look like draft picks, but maybe you never even stepped on the same field with, mm -hmm. you know? And I'd get uh, – I'm trying to think of a good example. You brought up Duquesne. Um, 
you know, I was talking to uh, Lorenzo Jerome, who was a uh, stud out of uh, what is it, Saint Saint Francis or whatever the whatever the NEC school. Yeah, and he was looking like a uh, uh, a draft pick himself, you know, out of a tiny NEC school, and he said, uh, you know what, I I would I was screaming at the TV watching Cooper Cup destroy. Washington or whoever they beat is mm-hmm. junior or Waz- senior year. Was it Wazoo or they got I think close. it was Wazoo yeah. or yeah, it was no, they Washington beat State or Oregon State. State. Yeah, and but they, you know, they all, you know how Eastern Washington always played a Pac-12 like a lot of big sky schools do, and mm-hmm. Cooper ripped them a new one every year, and they lost two close ones, and they you know, they hung like forty-five points on Oregon. You know, th- you're gonna tell me that Cooper Cup couldn't have played in the Pac-12, and look what he's doing against those schools. Um, and it wasn't just the last place Pac-12 team; it was Oregon when they were pretty good. And and look what you can do at this yeah. level. And Lorenzo, here's Lorenzo playing at a small school outside of Pittsburgh, rooting and screaming at the TV on for Cooper Cup in Eastern Washington. You yeah. know, and that's he said, "Hey, it's us against them." That's the perception. It's us against them. People said Cooper couldn't play, and look what he's doing. He goes, and people said I couldn't play, and I, you know, I, I, I may not get drafted, but I do think I'm going to get a chance. Um, yes, not only do FCS fans stick together in the, in the standpoint of, you know, amazingly, you know, a, a, a fan at Samford or Austin P probably loves seeing NDSU beat in Iowa. Not only do fans stick together on this, the players mm-hmm. get fired up about each other, and I yeah. think that is neat. In it, it's a uh, it's very unique because I can tell you in the SEC, there's not a lot of no. Alabama fans rooting for Auburn's big win. I'll tell no. you for damn sure that's not true. No, so. and yet we see it on the on our Facebook page, FCS Fans Nation, all the time, where it's like someone posts a highlight, especially right now with preseason going on, right? Like a lot of FCS guys, especially guys from last year too, because without the preseason, just some of these guys didn't get their chance to showcase, right? Uh, and people post highlights of their guys all the time, from Southern Illinois to you know Davidson to you know you get these guys and you're like, God, that's so awesome! I'm so glad your guys doing this or whatever. And like greedily for Idaho fans, like. We got a Monday night football game last week. Jacksonville Jaguars has our Jeff Cotton, who played wide receiver for us two years ago, mm-hmm. ends up leading that game in receptions and scores a touchdown. And he's going against Caden Ellis, our linebacker, who's yep, a starting yep. linebacker for the Saints. So we're yep. sitting here in Moscow, Idaho land, just going like, look at like it's Monday amazing. night football, and we've got a wide receiver showcasing out, and we got a starting linebacker like, Life is good. Life is fantastic. But, um, <laughs> yeah, man. I, yeah, Caden's a hell of a player, man. I yeah, mean, he, oh, that he was, was definitely on the. He was <laughs> always on the, uh, always on the radar screen. So yeah, that's a great example. So yeah. Uh, yeah anyways, it's uh yeah. Well, I mean, we're see, man. That uh, this whole title was going to be week zero with BMAC. I think now it's catching up with BMAC with a hint of week zero. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let's uh let's get into week zero. Okay. Try to keep this podcast time late. There's not a lot to cover, so I think we'll we'll turn out all right here. Sure. Um, you know we got we got a couple games this weekend. Um, y- yeah, let's start with the first one: Eastern Illinois, Indiana State. Uh, yeah. I don't know if now you're not on it, you're doing score predictions or whatnot, but we can go wins losses here. What are you expecting to see out of these two teams? ESPN Plus, unfortunately, once again, we don't we don't get it nationally televised, not put our best foot forward here. But uh, we'll move past that. 6 p.m. Eastern time um, in I pay, Indiana. I pay for it. I pay for it. I oh, yeah, I'm it. on it. Yeah, I'm yeah, on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody, everybody now except the CAA is an ESPN Plus oh, uh, yeah. member. So unless you're CAA folks, the rest of us aren't paying for flow. So yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> you guys can enjoy ESPN and watch the rest of us um, and then tell us how your teams are doing. But uh, Eastern Illinois, Indiana State, what are you looking for out of this one? What do you yeah. think you're going to see? You know, Indiana State uh, not um, playing last year. So, uh, it's yeah, going to be interesting. It, it, um, well, okay, so uh, I got to sit front and center with Adam Cushing at Eastern Illinois two summers ago and uh, in Nashville and uh, with my son who interviewed his players, which was a lot of fun. 
and Adam was really cool to my son. And, and, um, he had just been hired from Northwestern. Uh, he was the O-line coach at Northwestern mm -hmm. in the big 10 for gosh, 10 years, I think. <clears throat> so he had a, quite the resume, I thought, and they had really struggled under Kim Dameron, um, and hadn't really done much since Jimmy Garoppolo left, you know? Yep. Well, I remember him telling me, and you knew they were going to stink that first year. He he told me kind of off the record, but I don't think he would have a problem with me saying it now. Yeah, he was really cleaning house, and um, and the funny thing is, <laughs> my phone my phone just beeped about ten minutes ago while you and I were talking, and it was it was Coach Cushing. Uh, I hit him up when I was kind of getting ready for talking to you, Chris, and I hit. I, I was researching, you know, how things were looking for that for Eastern Illinois this year. And I'm like, holy crap, these guys, these guys might be good this year. And, uh, and I told him, I was like, man, you kind of, you alluded to this, you know, and they did play five or six games this spring. Yeah. And uh, they didn't really have a good year with that either, but the entire team is back and not only are they back, they're only two seniors out of 21 returning starters. So not only should they be pretty good and improved this year, they're going to be good next year and probably really competitive in the OVC. And that's why, like, I, I saw that the betting line out, and I think you and I can talk about that, and that's mm -hmm. not a taboo. Um, the betting line is uh, 13.5, 13 and a half points. Uh, to Indiana State, you know, um, but I don't think that's right at all. In fact, I'll tell you right now, and I, I love what Indiana State's been doing in recent years with Coach Mallory, um, which he was a guy that we did. I did a coach's corner with him last summer, a podcast, and what he's done at ISU is amazing. I think this game is going to be a whole lot better than people think because they're probably looking at it on paper and going, ah, you know, the Eastern Illinois went one and five last spring yeah. and one and 11 the year before. Well, that's because he cleaned house. You know, he, he got, he must have run a tight ship and brought in his own kids the last two years. And now the team is predominantly sophomore and uh, a couple of junior starters with just two fifth year seniors and 21 guys back. They've got 10 back on offense. They've got eight back on defense, all three specialists, you know, and, and you kind of look at this and you go, okay, all right. Well, if these kids have some talent, uh, they have, I, I saw they had 41, I, I was reading their spring or their um, preseason prospectus. Uh, you have 44 lettermen returning or something Jeez. like that. And he's, he, so Cushing knows how to develop an O-line. Mm -hmm. That's what he does. That's what he did at Northwestern. And I think it, I think it's entire O line returns. So, you know, they're going to be a strong team up front. Uh, they're not going to be a finesse team. And you ask for a pick. I mean, I don't know. Indiana State seems to be kind of rebuilding. Yeah, I could see that for sure. Um, so I, I don't think that line is on right at all, first of all. Um, I think it's going to be a really good game. And I, man, I, you know, it's kind of a fun pick, but I would go with EIU. Because yeah. I really think in hey. the next two years, they're going to be as good as they've been since Garoppolo left in 13. Yeah. It, it, it's yes, you know? yes. You never know. Especially you never know. This yeah. what, what I love about this matchup is somebody <laughs> is going to claim, uh, you know, rest versus rust. We get rest versus rust right off the bat. We get a team that played six games in the spring. Right. And a team who hasn't played since 2019. Right. Somebody, whoever comes out of this, can be like, see, we told you, rust. No, we told you, rest. We're more, as you kind of touched on, it's kind of just a pretty even matchup. I'd agree with you that 13 and a half is, um, seems high. My yeah. bookie doesn't have it yet, so uh, I'll have to keep on that for tomorrow morning. But yeah, I'm looking at 2019, last time they played in Indiana, Eastern Illinois wins, uh, or sorry, Indiana State, the Sycamores, wins 16-6. So you got a 10-point yeah. game. Yeah. As we touched on, most of these teams, relatively similar to their 2019 selves, um, especially, you know, the ones that played in 2020. It's in Indiana again. You touched on it, Eastern Illinois. Got to play this spring with a lot of young players. Yep. That's going to benefit them. Indiana yes, State is. took the year off. 
I I agree with you. If I if right now uh, I'd be willing to say I mean I'll put picks out tomorrow on who I actually take and where. But I'm with you. If the spread is 13 and a half, I'm probably taking the Panthers to cover. I mm-hmm. don't think I'd take a money line on that game. I still think Indiana State wins. Mm-hmm. Um, but Eastern Illinois, getting that time to play. Some of these teams really benefited from the spring. Teams like Eastern Illinois that had young players uh, mm-hmm. and got them reps. It's going to be a close game. And and for those that tune on ESPN+, Plus, I think they're in for a good uh, kind of retaste of FCS football. Uh, and you get a little cross-conference here that feels kind of conference because Illinois and Indiana are close. Uh so there, there's going to be a little bit of like that fan animosity, <laughs> right? Uh, they they kind of live with each other, even if they're yeah, not it is the same a rivalry. Conference. It is, yeah. it is a rivalry game. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. I'm excited for it. I, I, I think uh, it'll be a good game. I think I think Sycamores pull it out though. Um, mm-hmm. Well, they're up. a little better. Oh, yeah. They're a little stronger program. Yeah, I mean, currently. they have been. Yeah, I mean, they first of all, you know, in 2018, they should have made the playoffs. They got screwed. There's yeah. no question. And, uh, you know, they went five and seven in 2019. And I remember that year, it was like they had a couple close losses. But we really thought that even in the Missouri Valley, that Indiana State was a playoff team going into 19. And, uh, I mean, Mallory, you know, Mallory's the son of Bill Mallory, who was one of the more successful recent Indiana Hoosiers coaches. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's got the bloodlines to turn a program around. And he was doing that. And he was, boy, you want to talk to, about a pissed off coach when they didn't get in. Um, I mean, they to, to go seven and four in the Missouri Valley and not get in. Yeah. Was like a real head scratcher, but uh, back in 18. So they felt like they had some unfinished business. But the only problem is they just, they don't have a whole lot back on, especially on offense. And they, and like you said, Chris, they haven't played in nearly. 24 months. I mean, it's like, I'd say 21, 22 months. Yeah. They haven't seen live action since then. They yeah. were one of the first schools in the Missouri Valley that say, look, we're, we're not even going to try. Yeah. yeah. Cause I think then so, they, they pulled out and that's when the Missouri Valley had their joint statement of like, yep. the rest of us are in though. Um, at first. Yeah. 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 Um, but uh, so it'll be interesting <clears throat> to see, like I said, it, it's funny that the opening game of FC, FCS is going to be rest versus rust. That is yeah, yeah. Perfect. Can't write it any better. Yeah. Um, moving on. Then we get a nice little HPU or HBCU kind of showdown oh, yeah. in Atlanta, Georgia. We get Alcorn State, a team that's been pretty stinking good as recently, uh, playing North Carolina Central. Yeah. Uh, what, what are your thoughts, opinions on this one? This game will be on ESPN at yeah. 7 p.m. Eastern. I've heard rumors game day might be there, but oh, it's not a rumor anymore. It's fish. They're coming. There yeah, you go. we got game day. FCS we got game week day. one. Mm-hmm. And that, so. and not only that, uh, you know, this is the Miax Whack Challenge, mm-hmm. which they always have at the beginning of the year. Um, don't be surprised if thirty or forty thousand people show up here. Oh, I mean, yeah. it's that type of game, and you know, Allcorn draws well anyways. Allcorn's always drawn more than twenty thousand to their home mm-hmm. games. Is this and, in the, do you know is this in the Superdome or that uh, Globe Life or whatever the where Georgia State plays the converted baseball field? I you know I should know that and I don't know which. I'll one Google they it play. while you talk. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Please bring it up too because that you know if, if, if either way, if it's beautiful the, stadiums. Yeah, no doubt. Either way, you win. You know, and um, yeah, I think with this being you know it's not a traditional classic like the bayou classic or you know one like one of those Mm -hmm. uh you know but the but it's a good matchup um all corn state is the better program and they of course were in the celebration bowl after 2019 season and they uh lost the north carolina a&t but uh all corn is good their quarterback is a badass man Felix Harper is yeah. one of the best quarterbacks in the FCS. You know, he's a 3000 yard passer. He's a, he's a running threat. And then he's got Nico Duffy running the ball. who was nearly a thousand yard back. Now, you know, like you said, uh, out of all the teams playing this weekend, um, the only one who even attempted games last year was Eastern Illinois. All the rest of these teams sat out the season, you know? Yeah. So Alcorn is had not played since, 2019 but 
you know, Nico Duffy is legit at running back. And then you've got, I mean, they've got their leading tackler back uh, with Juwan, uh, John uh, Taylor and uh, his most dangerous pat, uh, receiving threat. Skill-wise, Alcorn is going to hang points on everybody they play. I mm-hmm. don't care if it's FBS. You know, I mean, they're traditionally one of the best HBCU programs. And, uh, you know, if you see Alcorn line up against a, a, a Southern Miss or, uh, you know, one of the Louisiana schools like uh, Louisiana Lafayette, you know, which goes by Louisiana now, but, you know, the Raging Cajuns and, yeah. you know, you know what I mean, Louis, Louisiana Monroe and all that. I think uh, Alcorn can score some points with those teams. I don't know if they could stop them, but they can pile on some points with these talents. So you got to think Alcorn is the heavy favorite here. And I didn't see – I was digging for the line. Maybe you have it, Chris, but um, I'm sure there will be a line on it. But, yeah, it may yeah. not come out till Friday. But uh, uh, And then NC Central has been pretty good, too. They haven't been total slouches They um, over the last number of years. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they've been in the Celebration Bowl in recent years. Um, they have a 2,000-yard sophomore back. Um you know, and they, they have grid skills, skill kids. So you might see a shootout, and those are fun. Yep. You know, um, so I think it's a great matchup to kick things off, but I I do think Alcorn is the more established program. You know, Fred McNair, you, that McNair name, man, there's always a McNair at Alcorn, you know, going yep. back a lot of years, you know, to Air McNair and that whole story. So. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it, it's just, I think that's a good one too. I, yep. I, they're all intriguing in their own ways. And, and I think that one is pretty intriguing. You yeah. Know? This it's, it's, so it is at center park credit union stadium okay. for that converted baseball stadium that when the Braves moved. So, I mean, it's, it's set up for football now. Georgia state plays all their games there holds 24,333. They could fill that. Easily. Oh yeah. Oh easily. yeah. And that's, yeah. If we're talking, boom, there's your – that everything we just said is totally relevant. Like, there's your best foot forward game, right? Like, right. sure, these are programs that not maybe everybody's heard of, but once again, the HBCU – if there's – if the FCS is passionate, the HBCUs are the, the segment within the FCS that are also super passionate. Very. Um, so there are people that are very well aware of Alcorn State and very well aware of North Carolina Central, like – this game can draw some eyes, and especially if you turn that on, I don't think they should struggle with 24,000. No. Uh, you turn that on, on ESPN, with game day, you get Corso throwing on one of these hats yep. uh, or, or headwear, and uh, I think you'll get people to tune into this. I don't think it's button up against any of the FBS games. So um, big opportunity here. Uh, I'm with you. I think Alcorn probably, the game competitive-wise – I think Alcorn's going to make it rather uncompetitive. Yeah. Um, but that's also because I'm a, a compass elitist. I, I don't like picking schools with directions in their names. So <laughs> that, that sticks. I went I went Indiana State over Eastern Illinois, and I, I'm going Alcorn over North Carolina Central, <laughs> the, the, old, the old Eagles. Yep, yep. But, yeah, no, I think uh, that's a good one. And it's always, 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 you know, Speaking of what's good for the uh, collective, and uh, hey, in a million different ways in life, I am not a collectivist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But when it comes to the whole level being in unison and, and being stoked, um, you know, anytime college game day puts the spotlight on an FCS game, that's a big deal. It's big. It's huge. Yeah. And and you know, HBCU football has a buzz about it. That oh yeah. It with Dion coaching, you know, that's just huge at Jackson yeah. State because Jackson State has sucked. You got Eddie for years. Eddie George now. Eddie at Tennessee George. State. Yeah. And and I'm telling you, Florida AM, uh Willie He's Simmons. And I know I yeah. talk about him. I've I've talked about him a lot in the past. Uh, because I know him really well. I covered him in high school. He's a great coach, great guy, mm-hmm. and an up a true up and comer. I mean, he turned Prairie View around, which was one of the worst hbcu programs over the last 30 years uh and he he made a winner out of them nearly i mean he he was able to make an argument that maybe they should get a playoff spot you know after they were eliminated Mm -hmm. from playing in the swag title game i mean that's how good willie is 
And FAMU is the type of place that you could become a monster. And Willie's doing a great job there, and he's facing off against Dion in, in week one. There's yeah. a lot of good stuff to talk about with the HBCUs, and I think oh, yeah. that's why you're getting game day. Oh, that's, it would have been so easy, too, for them to throw. I think it's October 9th on the schedule in front of me. Is Sanders versus George. It would have been very yeah. easy to put that here. Game day in an NFL city. Like, obviously would have drawn the eyeballs. I kind of like this, though. Like, we'll warm you up with a really good program. We'll introduce you to another one. Because yeah. folks are already going to watch Neon Dion versus the Heisman winner, Eddie George. Like, right. uh, that probably will get its own bit of hype. And yeah. maybe game day again, especially like you said, uh, with stuff going on in this country, there's been a light shine on HBCUs like never before. You're right. seeing a lot of recruits uh, that might have otherwise given it a second chance for the that's, glitz and glamour of the SEC. Yep, that's the um, thing. Weg Dion, he said he took this job because he wants to give back um, and be part of the change. And uh, I think this is a great way for ESPN to highlight it. Maybe a little too little too late in terms of took them long enough to do it, but yeah. they're doing it. And they've got a lot of good ones to pick from in this year and upcoming years. Um, so it's a good move. It's it's really cool that game day's there. It's going to be on ESPN. Man, maybe it would have been cool to bump it to ABC. I don't know what it's competing with on Saturday. But um, either way, we'll take our wins where we can get them. And having this, you know, primetime, 7 o'clock Eastern. So you're looking at, what, 4 o'clock Pacific. Like, couldn't ask for a better kickoff time. Uh, it's it's going to be a good one. Uh, last yeah. matchup, and probably the least exciting matchup, um, the Southern Utah Thunderbirds of the Big Sky slash WAC now are traveling to the Mountain West champion San Jose State Spartans of the FBS. Um, though I am a yeah. huge I'll, – I'll let you take the lead on this. Uh, I get to talk Thunderbirds all the time, uh, and then – uh, living in Boise, Idaho, I uh, get to hear about San Jose State as they play the the beloved Broncos down here quite frequently. But um, uh, what what's your thoughts, opinions on this? Are we going to get our first FBS FCS upset in this one? I don't think so. Um, uh, you know, they uh, Southern Utah. I mean, you never know, but I you know, the, uh, first of all, I mean, I love Southern Utah's quarterback. We. Uh, one of the things that, that I got cranking back in 2015 was um, I asked the powers that be in the FCS, would you like me to do a sophomore All-American team? I was like, mm -hmm. why, you know, why not? But I, but if people think it's kind of BS, then I, I won't do it. And everybody's like, yeah, 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 absolutely. What's it hurt to do some more recognition? Well, one of our selections for um, the sophomore All-American team back in 2019 was Justin Miller at Southern Utah. I mean, he <clears throat> he had a great year. He's a 1,700 yards passing, 15 mm -hmm. touchdowns. And, and you know, if, you, if you've if you got that kind of talent coming back at the signal caller position, you really have something to build with. And, um, and I, you know, so I think there's some things going on there. I think they've got some uh, skill position talent. They have a really good linebacker back. Um, it, they're not that far. There are guys on this team who are upperclassmen who have seen success at this program yep. and signed letters of intent with this program um, when they were winning big sky titles, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and, and I remember uh, they nearly knocked off a pac 12, I want to say uh, back in 16 or 17, I mean, they're really not that far removed from success under DeMario Warren, um, it, you know, it, but it wasn't, it really, you know, they've kind of struggled of late. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and on top of that, San Jose State, which was one of the stinkiest FBS programs uh, yep. up until, yeah. I mean, they've come around a little bit, um, you know, I, the year that, that UC Davis beat them, which was, I don't know, 18 or 17. I can't remember which one. Mm -hmm. um, I, shoot, man, I predicted it. I, I was yeah. like in my, in my picks contest, I, I remember it was week one and uh, it was like, all right, UC Davis looks pretty darn good. You know, they got Keelan back and um, they're playing San Jose state, which is, you know, perennial one and 11 and a group of five conference. 
Mm-hmm. And I was like, man, that's just ripe. San Jose State is a team a good UC Davis team can take out. I just don't know enough about the Southern Utah team to be that bold with any kind of prediction that they would knock a FBS off. I, um, but I don't see this being 45, nothing. I'll say yeah. that, you know, I think it could be interesting for a while and I know it's boring, but probably it'll be the depth thing. Yeah. That, and I hate that because it makes you, you know, whenever you see a halftime score and an FCS is beating an FBS at the half and you're like, man, if they can just make a carbon copy of the first two quarters yeah. and project it to the third and fourth, it shows that the one when the ones are playing the ones, look what can happen. Oh, yeah. Halftime, know? halftime kills them sometimes because they, they get to go inside. It's not that like. You know, they forgot what they're doing, but like when you sit down for that second, that 30 minutes off, your body starts to feel it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, man, if they almost could just rolled through halftime and played four quarters, no break, they might have won this. But yeah, when you get to sit there for 30 minutes and like you said, your body wears down and so does the other teams, but now the other teams twos are, you know, good enough to probably play on your team as starters. Uh-huh. But because they just have irreplaceable or I mean most positions are just almost rotational especially like you look at your D line front seven even your secondary these days your defense can basically all rotate unless you just have a stud Mm -hmm. Um, it just kill especially like offensive linemen they just when they don't get those fresh breaks you can't rotate in the left tackle right Uh, but when they're bringing in two three four DNs that can rush every single your first down your second your third your fourth and they're all six six two eighty and run a four five. <laughs> like uh, it, eventually, it's gonna wear down your your one left tackle, your one center, uh, et cetera. Um, yeah, Southern Utah, they've got some pieces. Like yeah, they Justin Mil- Justin Miller gets to throw at the land of me some uh, on the back end. You know, Brandon I'm a big Shanks. yeah. yeah I'm, I'm a I'm a Trey uh, Trey Walker guy, but like if there's another number eight in the Big Sky Conference that people need to be aware of, it's Laaka Kahano Ohano Davis. He is a freak. He's probably going to make the show. Uh, but I just don't think those pieces are enough. And trust me, if there's anything I hate more than directional schools, it's state schools with a city in them, like San Jose State. <laughs> San Jose is not a state. It's a city. But uh, I'm going to have to take the Spartans on this one. Um, yeah. I agree with you. It's not going to be 45 zip, but I don't see it being uber competitive. I could see this being one of those halftime games. Like Southern Utah maybe goes in and it's like, 10 21 and you're like okay like 11 points that's not that bad they can you know they get the ball in the second half or whatever but i could see it maybe ending like you know 17 45 something like that um yeah but yeah i don't have a lot of faith in the t-birds i do think they're building i think demario warren maybe had to hit the reset button i think maybe he inherited some talent took it to where it was going and then looked around and went "Ooh, maybe the cupboards are a little bare it's time for me to get back to work yeah. Um, and cause he seemed to have made Southern Utah and we were covering at one point last year, they were, you know, a handful of seconds, like probably one minute and 14 seconds away from being undefeated last season. So mm-hmm. like most of their games came down to final plays, final drives, et cetera. Uh, so they're definitely on the right page. Justin Miller still young. Uh, Ohana Ohana Davis is still young, but, uh, I, I just don't think it's there this year, especially when San Jose state is, uh, like thanks to 2020, they and them being G5, they're basically returning everybody from mm-hmm. probably the best San Jose State team that school's ever had. Mm-hmm. So um, that one will be rough, but that's week zero. Uh, three yeah. games, three you good did great games. Great with those Polynesian names, man. Oh, that's... I, I, uh, we took it upon ourselves in the Big Sky like community. <laughs> to, right? so, somebody had to learn the correct pronunciation that was a lot of flashcards a lot of late nights uh working on enunciation <laughs> slow fast you know with a little bit of flair but yeah i've got i've got his name down now but oh, only about twice a show because i feel like the third time i'm gonna slip and it's all worth nothing there uh but bmac thank you for joining me yeah, longest, ep- longest episode of the football chris show but uh I mean, we covered probably the widest array of topics. Like I said, it was going to be all week zero. Now it's just catching up with BMAC with a hint of week zero. Um, <laughs> before before I let you go, uh, let you out of the hostage cage here. Um, <laughs> well, where can the people find you and uh, let them know what you got going on in your life? 
Yeah. Uh, well, I'm on Twitter, and nothing's changed there. I, I, uh, it's one of the reasons I have always gone by a generic name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because, you know, things change in your career sometimes. But I'm at Brian MacRider, and uh, um, talk to me. I, I'd love to talk to you. You know, um, that that's the fun thing about this gig is getting in conversations with people, you know, and it's a lot of fun. So, uh, so yeah, no, um, that, I'd love to talk to you and then uh, hit me up anytime. Yeah, of course. I, I we'll, we'll definitely be doing talking to you again. And just a reminder to everybody out there. Thank you for tuning in. If you have uh, show ideas, topics, whatever, this is what this is about. Getting more of you on the Facebook page involved. Uh, comment them on the Facebook, the Twitter, the YouTube, wherever you found this. Your show idea. Maybe you get to come on. Be like BMAC. Be our guest. Anyways, thank you for tuning in to the FCS, a.k.a. the Football Care Show, because acronyms are great. Directional state schools stink. We'll catch you guys <laughs> in the next one. Thanks, dude.